And we're live. It's the Mind Stain Marketing Hour with our favorite mad scientist. He doesn't wear a white coat. He doesn't carry a clipboard. What's he do? He helps you get your mind state going right. Will, how are you, brother? Hey, doing well. Happy New Year, my friend. How are you today? I'm excellent. We've got a great guest today. We're excited. Here's the intro. I'm going to run it. Chef Wade's in the house. It's the Mind State Marketing Hour with Will Leach. He's got his fancy leather coat. <laughs> okay. Three steps to creating what? We This was last. This is a, a failure. On, a failure. There's our first failure for <laughs> this episode of two failures and a win. Yeah. Will, crazy. Well, so, you gotta go. You gotta go figure that out, there, Steve. Hey, welcome, welcome everybody to the show. I appreciate you coming. I have a very special guest uh, with us today, uh, Chef Wade Birch. Say hi to everybody, Chef Wade. Chef Hello, Wade. everyone. Thanks for having me. That's right. Well, hey guys, let me tell you a little bit about Chef and Steve. I don't know how much you know about Chef either. So, uh, you know, Chef Wade Birch. Uh, he is the owner of a brand new entrepreneur, kind of new at least, anyways. Uh, of, of, of WB's table, and he is the winner of Food Network's hit show, Chopped. We're going to talk a little bit about that today, I'm sure, because I know you're a foodie, Steve. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, let's talk a little bit about, Chef, Chef I'm going to give you all the time you want to talk a little bit about your life, but I want to throw accolades at you because it's deserving. So Chef Wade has had this amazing career, if we think about it, um, as an executive chef in some of the country's finest kitchens. Um, he was trained at the School of American Chefs at Behringer's Vineyards in Napa Valley and at Windows um, on the World Wine School in New York City. He's the, or he was the executive chef at Pearl on Maple, which is a really cool restaurant here in Dallas, Texas. Um, and then he's also kind of done work over at the Plaza Hotel in New York City. I'm sure many people have known about that and weren't able to get in. I never can get in there. Uh, the Pan Pacific Hotel in San Francisco and the Hotel Crescent Court, which is also a really famous uh, a hotel here in Dallas. But then, um, you know, in 2021, he took the big gamble like all of us did out there, all the entrepreneurs out there listening. He became an entrepreneur um, and opened Wade's Kitchen, which is a catering and takeout concept that took off so quickly that within the next year, he actually opened it up to um, Wade's Table, which is a beautiful gem of a restaurant in Frisco, Texas. And I actually know Chef personally, not only, uh, you know, just kind of from his accolades and seeing him on TV. So, Steve, I know you can relate to this. Yeah. So, Chef Wade comes into our neighborhood, right? Yeah. You know, we all kind of have this thing going, and then his, him and his beautiful family come in, and very quickly, he becomes the go-to house, right? Everyone starts going to his house. They're yeah. not coming to my house anymore. He's got the right wine. He's got the right fans and the guests and the people there. He's got the right family. He's got the right food. Um, and to be honest with you, he also gives back to the community quite a bit here in, in the Dallas area. And now he's an entrepreneur. So, I was sitting there thinking about how do I start off the new year? Um, who do I want on the show? And Chef Wade came to mind because he is going to talk about just a life that we probably can't really identify with until you hear about it, of just being an executive chef and things that you do, Wade, and dealing with people and successes and failures that are relatable to anybody, especially the entrepreneurs that are out there um, you know, listening to the show. So, hey, with that, Chef Wade, Thank you for being here, buddy. I appreciate you being on the show. Wow. I don't know how I can uh, follow all that up or live up to all those accolades. Um, I must be old. Uh, is the first thing I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> sounds like I've worked a lot more. I'm kind of tired, actually, hearing you talk about everything I've done. I know. Um, my voice is as well. My voice is well. Don't get too tired because I'm going to ask you to, to fill in some of the details, you know. So I'll kick us off here. Chef, we just want to get to know you. For anybody out there who doesn't know you, so you have a personal story, like where did you come from and how in the hell did you kind of get to where you are today? With, you know, that whole kind of story as best you can to let us get a better feel for who you are. What makes you tick? Well, I don't think we have enough time in this 45 minute show because between the two of you, you've already stolen 11 minutes of my time. If I, I <laughs> watch the clock right. so, uh, let me see if I can give you the short version because Early on, one of my bosses used to say about me, if you ask me what time it is, I'll tell you how they make watches over in Sweden at Rolex. Um, because I did go to Behringer, but I got there through a scholarship. So a lot of people say self-trained. I'm not self-trained. Um, and it's not school of hard knocks because I'm still standing. I have been fortunate enough to be around people 
who knew more about cooking than I did, who knew more about life than I did. And I am blessed with, I think, I don't know if it's a fully photographic memory, but I am very much the person who can ape or see something, mimic it and copy it like uh, a talking bird, like the minor birds or the parrots. I can see something, usually catch it really fast and emulate it. Musicians do that. They call that having an ear. Well, I learned to play piano when I was really young. The lady I went to church with um, playing golf. One of the gentlemen I went to church with. Again, I'm going to go back to that because for me, a lot of my upbringing was focused around being at church. And what you'll find, at least I do now at 56, looking back, is all of these people are all from different walks of life. Every single person I interacted with, whether I realized it or not, was teaching me a lesson be it to always keep trying to go sailing, catamaran sailing in the Gulf of Mexico in Texas City. Who would have ever thought that an engineer that worked at NASA is going to take some 15-year-old kid out on a catamaran, 14-foot Hobie cat, and go sailing in waters where the Houston Ship Channel is bringing super tankers in and cargo ships full of things that we all need? I wasn't thinking about that at the time. I was out with a guy who was three foot shorter than me. It was like four foot eight. A gentleman named Walker Horn who taught me about how things go together, how to tie knots, how to follow a systematic step. Because if you don't follow those things where you go sailing and there's two of you on a boat, you can die. Mm -hmm. So kind of like a lot of things like Patton going into battle, perfectly executed plan is great next week. Let's just go now and figure it out because the war could be over before we get there. So sometimes having that sense of urgency or that not worrying about failure because at 14 you don't think you're going to die you're invincible yeah, when yeah. we get older when we have a college degree when we get married when we have families when we have a house when we have responsibility that's when people start to stop on the brakes and be like wait a minute i got too much to risk i don't want to lose this i better better think this through but when you start thinking too much that's when you fail because Just you're wait. Not let me ask you though though so you had these experiences where people have seen something in you, especially when you're younger, and they they took you whether it's sailing or or maybe somebody at church who introduced you to a new idea. But somehow you got into food. Like what was? Do you remember that attraction to food and well, what made you do that? Well, that's kind of what it was. Is I remembered all these big socials that we'd have luncheons once a month, and everyone cooked different food. Some of it was good, some of it wasn't. But I was always, I guess intrigued by how so many different variations of even the same thing could be there and how did they taste different or why did they look different pea salad with american cheese or cheddar cheese and mayonnaise and onions how big were the onions why were they red why were they white i started to notice there were nuances and differences and i started catching on that why did my grandmother in west texas out near mineral wells make better pies and my grandmother in East Texas that lived in a trailer can vegetables and do preserves and grow her own vegetables in the garden. Well, because in East Texas, it's cooler weather, it's more moist and as sandy soil, the vegetables grow better. There was shade from the pine trees and West Texas is too dry and too barren. So they raised cattle and they baked and did other things. So it was kind of, I got to see pretty much a whole meal if you put everyone together in one room. So my mother was a great cook. Both my grandmothers. My father made an amazing coconut cream pie. I grew up in Texas City. I could ride my bike to the bait camps and get live shrimp off the boats as they were unloading them. So I was in an area that, while it's mainly known for chemical refineries and making more gasoline than most people will ever use and providing gas for half the country, the lower half at least, it's a refining town. But Refining means money. Oil means money. So my high school had pre-AP classes before other areas had them. So I got to take chemistry as a sophomore. I got to take biology, uh, anatomy and physiology, one and two. I had college credits when I graduated in physics, chemistry, biology, anatomy. I thought I was going to be a doctor. I yep. thought doctor or veterinarian, that's what I want to do. I grew up, I love to eat, so I better have a really good job because I have expensive taste and a beer pot book, as my dad used to say. So I better find a way to make some cash. Yeah. Well, I thought that's what I'll do. So where did the, where did it come from your grandmother? Did it come from yeah, your mother? Know, Who, where's that. this cooking? I talked about this last night, excuse me, preparing for this um, call. And I said, you know, where was it? She goes, 
you know, until you got fired at that vet clinic, you didn't even talk about cooking. <laughs> and I'm like, you're right. That's when it was. So I failed at getting along with a new guy. And Will, you'll love this because he, he went to LSU. Um, this new hotshot comes into the vet clinic where I'm working. Again, two guys from church. And I thought I was going to take over the clinic. They had already put money aside for me. I started working when I was, I had a work permit, but legally not able to work. Um, cleaning dog kennels and doing flea dips. And I thought I'll be a vet. Well, this guy gets there, turns out he's going to buy the practice and tells me one of them has cancer. They didn't want to tell me they're retiring. He bought the practice. He takes over in a week. So get used to it. He's going to run the roost. And I now answer to him. And I said, it's funny. They didn't tell me anything. Yeah, they don't have the heart to tell you. I said, well, guess what? I said, I don't like your attitude, college boy. So good luck running this place with no employees because me and the other two guys are leaving. And we walked out. Well, 14 years old, 15 years old, pretty smart guy, I thought. Um, <laughs> I get in my car, I drive about a mile, and I'm like thinking, how am I going to pay for this car, the gas, the insurance? My dad's going to kill me. How am I going to pay for this stuff? And I see a now hiring sign at a fast food joint, a place called Pofo, folks. Little arrow with the white letters like El Arroyo. I pull in, walk in, the guy says, what do you want? I said, it sells now hiring out front. He says, what do you want? I said, a job? Isn't that what now hiring means? And he says, oh, he said, can you read? I said, I told you, I said, I read the sign that says now hiring. I said, is this a joke? What are we doing here? This was before punked and all of that with Ashton Kutcher. So I'm thinking this guy's either A, testing me or B, not real bright. So if he's in charge, I'll be in charge in a week. So his name was Jerry, fill out the application. And he says, so got any questions? I said, no. He says, well, don't you want to know when you start? I said, so I'm hired. He said, well, you fill out the application. You answered my first two questions. You'll be fine. He says, you clearly can read. Here's the book. Be here tomorrow at eight. I said, what's this? He says, the Bible. I said, this doesn't look like the Bible. This is just recipes <laughs> and a plastic folder. He goes, yep, know all of them by tomorrow. You're in charge. You're the commissary cook. I said, I have zero experience. He goes, you can read. That's all I need. Show up tomorrow. Yeah, that was the first, that was your first kind of foray into the, where I got never paid, looked back. Where I got paid to apply heat and add salt to something that you eat. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was the beginning. You know, that's a, that's a rough career because it's hot. There's sharp knives. There's, there's slippery f floors. There's, it's cold in the freezer. It's people are, you know, they're, they're yeah. fast to critique whatever you put out. Why did you find yourself um, comfortable in that environment? Um, well, as I said, I got hired a week later. I got a promotion and a dollar raise. And back then, I think I made 405 was the minimum wage was like 375. And I got a dollar within a week. And I was in charge of guys in their 30s who weren't working at the refinery because they had been hurt or just didn't fit in. And I found out that a lot of these guys were misfits but kind of like the military or kind of like any other thing, there's a structure and there's discipline and there's a right way and a wrong way. And really early on in my career, my dad, everyone in my family was military except me. I'm the only man who went to college who didn't go into the military because all of my um, male you know, figures told me we had paid our debt. Someone needs to stay alive to take care of all the women. And sure enough, now it's just me and all the ladies. They're all passed on, but uh, grandmothers, aunts, I, I'm the only guy left, but they must have known something. Um, but cooking is really basic. Every single person watching this now who can buy a computer can cook their own food and sustain their own existence. You don't need to go out. No one has to go out to restaurants. The key to this, and this is the one thing I've talked to Will a couple times and other friends, being an entrepreneur, it's risky. It's scary. Um, how do I convince people to come give me their money for what I do and my take on food versus someone else? You don't know. You can try and read books. You can try and market. You can advertise. At the end of the day, it's once you get them in, you got to hang on to them. And I think that's the key to any marketing. Having not gone to sleepaway college for marketing, um, again, thought I was going to be a vet. Um, but I do have some classes in psychology that I took because – at 22 is when I became my first executive chef job. So wow. got promoted early on from just cook 
to crew chief, instant success, instant leadership with zero mind um, training, zero psychology, understanding of other people, no leadership training, no handbook on that, just a handbook on recipes. So I learned the hard way how not to treat people, how not to talk to mm. people, how not to lead. Leadership is not follow me because I'm your boss and I have a position. That's how most young people are told how to do it. And that's kind of an old way of thinking is follow authority. Well, why? You know, Patton said it, you know, I would rather have people who don't really care what my title is, but I'll tell them where I want to go and what I want done and let them just get it done. They'll impress you. They'll surprise you. That's probably not the exact way, but that's the, the sentiment I think that he had is find a way to be the leader, lay out what we want to do and let everyone chip in. Don't try and be the smartest person in the room. If you are, you're probably in the wrong room. Yeah. <laughs> so someone else said that too. I can't remember who that was. Yeah. Well, but, let me ask. So, you know, there, you, you've, you've done a lot of amazing things. And one thing we like to do on the show and you've kind of even talked a little bit about this, in fact, but it's this idea of, you know, we want, we oftentimes learn from other people's successes. And, and you and I actually talked about this not too long ago. It's actually, but we're drawn towards people's failures for whatever reason. We like to see people on, whether it's TV shows or in movies, we like to see kind of, and, and kind of bask in somebody's failure. And so we like to talk a lot about kind of times when you expected something to happen in the entrepreneurial journey or in life. And then all of a sudden it just didn't work out for whatever reason. So is there something in your mind? You're thinking you took a pivot. There was a point where, and maybe like you even gave us one, frankly, about the vet, but is there a pivot or something that happened when, you know, you, you could looking back and you're like, man, I thought that was a failure and here's the story, but actually now that was a success. And why can you give me a, an example of that in your career? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's happened. I mean, when Kristen and I first talked about this a few weeks ago, when, you were kind enough to ask me to join you as I, I started trying to, how do I put years or, or a long winded story into a little more concise snippet that people can get the nugget to take away without all of the fluff and the extra. Um, almost every job I've had, there's things I've done right and things I've done wrong. Um, and, and food is not new. Everyone, like I said, can cook there's only so many ways you can peel a carrot. There's only so many dishes you can make that can be called a pot roast or a braise. But whether it's the French version or the Indian version or a Mexican version or birria, they're all just different words that those cultures use to explain the same thing. A chunk of meat cooked with aromatic vegetables in a liquid with semi-dry heat with some moisture added at some point of the cooking that will take a really inedible piece of meat that has too much fiber because it was a usable muscle and render it into this delicious, soft, unctuous, soul satisfying, take you back like Ratatouille cartoon moments through transportation uh -huh. of the angry food critic tasting Ratatouille that a mouse made, really a rat, back to what <laughs> his mother made him as a kid. Yeah. Thomas Keller made that beautiful design. Thomas Keller is a chef who I've always admired and I've known for a lot of years. He liked the gentleman in Copenhagen who's about to close like Fer and Adria, like a lot of really well-known high-end chefs. You're not going to go eat at a five-star American restaurant or a three-star Michelin four times a week or even once a month or even twice a year because it's several thousand dollars. And while most people could do it, it doesn't make sense. There's other things you want to do with your money. And you're going to sit there as a grown adult and decide, do I want to spend 1500 bucks on dinner? Or do I want to go have a hundred dollar dinner tonight with my wife or 150 with my family and then be able to go do that 10 times? Yep. Because there's all we can economics are involved. And I'm going to have to eat every single day, at least twice a day if I'm, you know, a regular person, three if I'm fortunate. So why am I going to go drop all that money on one experience? Is it going to be that memorable? Is it going to be that great? And while the food is a lot of it, more often it's who are you with enjoying that experience? Yeah. It's the yeah. dialogue. It's not just the precision of the army of people that made that food. It's what's going on around you. What's the ambiance? Like um, 11 Madison Park. Will's really picky about the room and the temperature and the smell and the sense and 
the the thread count of the tablecloth and how the silver is polished and where it's placed. And I read or I saw a TED talk recently about he was listening to this group of foodies that were in New York and they missed the one thing they missed because they talked about all these restaurants they went to. His was the last. They saved the best for last. But they said, you know, our one regret is we didn't get a hot dog. He heard that pouring water two tables over. He had someone take care of the room. He ran down the street to a hot dog vendor, got them four hot dogs, brought them back, put them on a plate and served them (laughs) as a last thing, even after dessert, a New York City hot dog. So that their trip for food to New York would be complete. Not only did they write about it and over tip, the, he said the reward for him and his staff was to see the look on their face. Uh. And at the end of the day, I think that's why, and to your point, Steve, chefs, anyone in the hospitality industry, we put up with losing hosp- I mean, holidays, time with our family. We give up when everyone else is out eating. That's when we're working. Guess what? Part of it is we're narcissistic. We love it being about us. And when you're here, you're here to see me. So guess what? It's all about me. If I can take the energy you project to me and turn it back to making it all about you and your experience, that's how I've got you. Mm -hmm. And it's not in a dubious way or devious. It's how do I make you feel that you're the most important person in the room? Mm -hmm. It goes back to Dale Carnegie. What's your most, what's your favorite topic? What do you know the most about? What are you intimate with your entire Mm -hmm. self? That's Mm -hmm. mind state. Is it not will? And you know your mind better than anyone. You know the darkest parts you don't want to talk about. And you know the good parts. And you know how to, as you get older, and navigate life, what you share with colleagues. And in what setting is what conversation appropriate. Mm -hmm. When you're 20, you don't know near as much as you do at 40. And at 40, you don't know as much as you're going to at 60 if you make it. Mm -hmm. It's those Mm -hmm. life experiences, failures and successes, business, relationships, Divorce is now a common word. It used to be taboo. Growing up where I did and in the era I did, being 56 now, if you got divorced where I went to church, you were ostracized. Yeah, yeah. Same thing with failure. If you failed, you were a failure. If you dropped out of school, you were a failure. Now getting a GED is perfectly acceptable if you apply it right because there could be extenuating circumstances. Look at remote work, remote learning now. During COVID, if we said it wasn't okay for people to fail, and we didn't give some of these students an extra year to go back or to readjust or reassimilate, that would have been how many people that we lose in that one calendar year. Oh, yeah. Who knows what they're all going to turn out to do? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Chef Wade, how many times did you try out to get on uh, the Chopped show? Um, well, that actually was never a failure. I tried out. Um, <laughs> I didn't actually try out. I was approached by Susie Folgerson. So if you watch Next Food Network Star, the lady with the curly hair, she walked up to me at a trade show in New York in the Javits Center. I was walking down the aisle. She walked up and said, hey, you ever heard of Chopped? I said, Chopped Salad? She said, no, the TV show. I said, I don't know. Is that the one with the basket and the weird stuff? She goes, yeah. She goes, we're about to film. I think we're starting season five. Do you want to be on it? I said, I don't know. She said, well, it's competition. Three other chefs. I said, okay. She says, you can win 10 grand. I said, where do I sign? <laughs> yeah. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm going to win. So where do I sign up? And when do we, when do we tape it? She says, awfully arrogant. I said, you walked up to me. What's that say? If you're a producer, you picked me out of this crowd. There's what? 10,000 people in this room. I said, one person for every dollar I'm going to win. Tell me when, where do I show up? So what did you get like three tries at, during the an episode, right? At three surprise ingredient things. Um, I would imagine you didn't you didn't knock it out of the park on each one. But when you when you open that up and you see w- what you have to work with, what goes through your mind, and well, and where where are you going with that? Well, mm. back to mind state, and I don't want to sound like that I'm on a paid thing because this before no, this is not an endorsement. I'm not paid. I'm just I'm a guest. <laughs> um, chance favors the prepared mind. Again, another quote. Um, not just great from a movie, but uh, it's a great movie, by the way. Um, I don't know if you remember the one with Steven Seagal, Navy SEAL, chef, made lots of stuff, badass. Yeah. Remember that? That's right. <laughs> the guy's going to blow up the world with the train. Chance yeah. favors the prepared mind. Yeah. Okay. 
And he carries um, his chef knife. Yes. It does. Yes. So what my friends and I did is when I found I was going to be on, there was a four month gap. So we got out graph paper and we watched the show. And one of my friends is an engineer oh. and we blew it, the kitchen down onto graph paper and knew how many steps it was from each station. And then we did it in a high school gym because one of our friends is a coach and we blue taped it out. So I would know the framework of the space of the studio. Awesome. And we would practice every weekend in my house, three sets of families that my wife would bring over. And we would cook and they would go to Whole Foods and ethnic markets and they'd give me a basket. We called it chop nights. And the kids would be like the cameramen and run back and forth and drag extension cords to try and trip me. And they would time me. And wow. one of the kids would be Ted Allen and come over and ask me questions and bug me. And then they would judge me and they would rotate who the judges were. And they would bring other people in the neighborhood in that weren't friends of mine. And then they would all judge it and critique it. And we did it on the exact time frame with no breaks, no sitting down. And we tried to measure it the way we thought, because having been around other production, I knew it would take at least three hours. Turns out to make a, a chopped episode, if you win, you get there at 5 a.m., you leave at midnight. Wow. So that's yeah. an 18 and a half hour day. But luckily, I'm a professional chef and I'm building. There you go. There you go. Um, they feed you, they give you coffee, they hype you up. If you want alcohol, they give you alcohol so you'll have loose lips and give better sound bites. But they probe you. They, they, they goad you. They try and make you talk noise about your other competitors. They try to get different things, like Will said earlier, so they can make it more reality TV. But when it comes to the cooking part, it's, it's for real. Mm -hmm. When the basket opens, you have 30 minutes. Now, they practice the opening seven times. They get the lighting right. They change the blocking. They do the microphones. But when you actually start cooking and the clock starts, there is no stopping. And there is no extra help. And there's no talking. Now, they'll edit it out, but you hear the judges, and they'll actually sometimes be annoying. They're like, well, why are they doing that? I'm like, because this is my dish. You'll get to try it in a minute. And yeah. you got to be careful not, like with the other guy, you got to be careful not to say what you're really thinking. Sometimes they edit it. Sometimes they leave it in. Um, but you got to so be scared. So when I knew, when I walked in the room, and you've got to be aware of your surroundings, and we all take social cues, I saw a wreath on the wall. The other three people were wide-eyed. They had no clue it was going to be a holiday episode. So I'm instantly thinking, okay, there's going to be champagne. And I walk further down uh -huh. and there's a bottle of bubbly and there's holly berries and there's cranberries. And I'm like, you know what? This is Christmas, but we're in New York. There might be something else. You know, there's Jewish, there's Hanukkah, there's Diwali, there's, you know, Kwanzaa. So let me think New York melting pot. They're going to give me all these different foods. So let's be ready. So I'm thinking maybe there'll be a latke. Maybe there'll be some kind of a potato. Maybe there'll be an oyster. Oyster, oyster's Rockefeller. They're probably going to throw in gingerbread. They're throwing, what about a Christmas goose, Charles Dickens? Or will they give me a standing rib roast? Well, a rib roast would take too long to cook. How are you going to break that down? They would want that. So probably a goose. And I'm thinking, okay, I got to break down. I got to use at least four parts of the animal because having done hot food competition with the ACF and already having silver and gold medals, I've had four hours to do cooking, but I had an assistant. We had to make six courses. We had to make 10 plates of each one. You got certified master chefs judging you. So there's a lot more scrutiny involved mm -hmm. but far less money there's only like two grand on the line but the gold medal makes it so you can earn points to become like i am now a certified executive chef there's only one level higher in the accreditation yeah. to american culinary federation that's certified master chef there's only 73 in the country 60 uh, of those are my friends but i'm one step under and to achieve that not having gone to culinary school takes years of practice and competitions and written exams and it's on level with being an md not that the chef is the same as a doctor don't let anyone out there think i'm demeaning doctors you spend a lot of money to get those two letters i got three letters and spend zero so anyway you were you were prepared but but one of them was a dud well i made three baskets the first time and one the mm -hmm. champions round i made three baskets and one my way into the grand finale in the grand finale, I made appetizer and entree and then got chopped. So it took eight times for them to chop me. So was it really disappointing that I didn't get a chance for the 50 grand? Yes. Were my kids completely like so upset with me? Yes, because we went to <laughs> Disney with 10 grand. They're thinking 50 grand. We're really going to have a fun vacation. Different experience. <laughs> so while I was sad that I let them down, I thought I let myself down, but at the end of the day, 
I realized at the end, it, it, what does it matter? I'm still alive. I tried. I could have not tried. I could have just won the one time and said, you know what, I'm out. Like Michael Jordan. I mean, one of his most famous quotes is he's taken like 9,000 shots. He's missed. He's, he's lost almost 300 games. He's done all these things. He focuses on what he didn't do right. He said, but I never quit. I always kept trying. Versus yeah. everyone else wants to say he's the greatest of all time and say he's got five rings or six rings and he's done da 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 People love to either, like sports writers, talk about how great someone is based on all the success. They don't bring up the failure. The haters want to talk about only the failure and try to diminish the success. Yeah. I find what you've got to realize is there's good in both and take the lessons from the failure, focus on the success, but don't dwell on it and sit back and become so self-absorbed and inflated that you forget that you're still just a regular guy. You put your pants on the same yeah. way everyone else does every day. Hey, Gotta chef, let me ask you. So it, it dawns on me with that competition and just at any time in your profession, you know, in this competition, you're given a basket, you're given a bunch of variables and all of a sudden they open up and you've got to make sense of those variables very quickly and take action. Entrepreneurs have to do this all the time. Every day is different. You know, get a call from a client. They say they're not going to pay you and, and, and life can be very, very tough. So I've heard of this. I, I want to get, think about how does your mind work a little bit? So I've heard about musicians and I, I it may have been from the Beatles. I'm not positive. But this idea is that they, they look sometimes at the world and it's above their head and music is above their head. It's kind of it's in the atmosphere and the best musicians can just take inspiration. They don't know how they even do it, but they just, they see something and they bring it down and then they riff. And I imagine you're given these basket, it opens up and you've got to riff fast, right? So you, yeah, you're prepared, but you got to make sense of the, what you have in that basket. And you have to make those things come together in a way that's unique and powerful. Do you know how you do that? Is there a process you go? Is it just natural? Are you looking into the atmosphere and pulling down this stuff? Like, do you know your thought process or is it so instinctual that you're just reacting? I think the easiest way to answer that, and I don't know, it may, I'm just going to answer direct. It may sound arrogant or come off wrong, but it's like the more you do something, the more accomplished you become. Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, how do they read defenses so much better and faster than the rookies, than the Joe Burrows or the new ones talking about football, or how do accomplished athletes in any sport who've done it longer, it's, it's muscle memory part. It's having had failures that you try to hit a fastball and you try to pull it and it's foul three times or you miss and you strike out in a big game. It's how do you know when that ball is going to sink? How do you, when you're bass fishing, how do you know, what little ripple over there and where to throw it because you've thrown it 10,000 times and not got anything. And now you know what bait, what sunlight, what color it's a process of having tried and tried and it not worked out and remembering what didn't go right as much as what went right. And yeah. I think that's, and again, with every job, with every career, we all go through the same thing every day. If you didn't need to do what you do, your employer shouldn't be paying you because you're just sitting there killing time. So there's most jobs that still have people that do them, in my opinion. And this is all I really know. But having met so many people from so many walks of life, every job has the mundane, necessary, basic tasks you do every day that most people are to get them out of the way quickly and then move on to the fun stuff. Or they're just doing it over and over and over, but they find a way to get better at it and improve yeah. the process. Um, Cooking's kind of instinctual, like you say about musicians to some point, but it's also a learned over time. You learn yeah. that garlic and rosemary go with lamb. You learn that carrots have an inherent sweetness, that if you're going to have too much herbaceousness or something bitter, you bring in a carrot. You know that a carrot's sugar level is going to have a different effect on the sauce than an onion will, that an onion raw tastes dramatically different than it does cooked cooked in oil, it's not going to color as much as it will in butter because the addition of the lactic acid and the sugar in the milk is going to actually change the sugars in the onion. Sweating the onion first under steam or under um, heavier heat to release a lot of its water will make the water that's in there actually become part of the sauce and the sugars become part of solution. So if you keep the heat on high, you're going to burn them. If you turn the heat down, you're going to let that slowly evaporate while you change the cellular structure of the onion that actually will let it caramelize 
shrink in size, absorb some of its own sugar, which makes the onion taste more like onion, essentially glazing in its own juices, changing its cellular structure and its composition, but while keeping all of that intact and not adding water or adding something like water that would dilute the flavor. Most people add something, just don't add it, change a way to manipulate it and knowing the process and how to do that for two people at home versus 2,000 in a hotel setting versus 30,000 on a cruise ship and having a guy who has no ability to speak English because you're in the Midwest or you're in the middle of the uh, Pacific and you got Filipino people who don't speak English and you got to find a way to show them. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's, that's one of the added challenges. But at the end of the day, an onion's an onion. Yeah. Every cuisine uses the same vegetables, the yeah. same meat. A cow's a cow. It may just grow on different land and eat different feed. It may have a different flavor, be a different strain of cow. But at the end of the day, beef is beef. Goat is goat. Yeah. So yeah. it's knowing from having tasted it in different areas and different cuisines, how do you make that work for the end result you're trying to achieve? Well, yeah, it almost sounded as if you had, you used your experience to, we call it in my world, deselection. I was like, here are the things that I know I don't want to do because my experience would tell me that's not successful. And that eliminates a lot of the variables and the choices into where you, now you have more of a, like you said, a discipline of, okay, now I, it's probably intuitive. You don't even realize it, but you're like, I know I'm not going to combine these in this way. But because of that, you've, ev- you've eliminated a lot of the variables. So now you can work within your comfort zone because you know you're more likely to succeed, it sounds like, because your maturity, your experience has gotten you to a place where you know not to, it sounds weird, but you know these things would fail. Therefore, it, it brings you more likelihood for success. That's an interesting way of thinking about it because I don't know if many people think of it in that way. You know, most people are trying to say, how do I become successful in your way? Maybe at all chefs, it's almost as if you know what doesn't work over time. Therefore, it helps you, it helps constrain what you're going to work with, right? I love that. That's an interesting idea. I love that. Chef Wayne, first dish on your menu is chili. What makes a great chili? <laughs> well, I mean, again, kind of something I just touched on is onions. I mean, well, onions, onions are an important part, but you have to have good meat. Um, yeah. If you're talking Texas chili, I mean, yeah. first of all, there's no beans. Beans are filler. Beans are cheap. The reason chili, people added beans to chili is because they had no money in the Great Depression. They wanted to stretch it. Mm-hmm. The reason a lot of areas add crackers to it is crackers stretch it. Just like salmon cakes or croquettes or whatever else you want to call them. Canned salmon, eggs, stale crackers, crunch it up, salmon croquettes, fry them in leftover grease. A lot of the things that were popular in Texas and Louisiana are done out of desperation or poverty. And how do I feed a large group with very little protein? Same thing with chili. You think that cowboys are most notorious for chili, right? Mm. Where do you think they got that meat from? Do you think they went to the Tom Thumb or the H-E-B? No. They took the cow that died. They cut it up. They drug it along with them for a while. When it started to smell too bad because there were no refrigerators, they needed to eat. They applied heat, they had salt, they added spices to cover up the fact that it probably tasted rancid and smelled horribly. So we talked earlier before we came on live to hide the old factory so that they couldn't smell how bad the meat tasted. They overly seasoned it and spiced it. They didn't have any stock or running water. They took the leftover coffee from the morning. So that adds bitter. They had salt, they had bitter, and now they had spice. So all they had to do was add a little sweet. They probably had honey or sugar with them because they always kept sugar around. Sugar also would help to cure it and stop the decomposition. If they were smart, and some cultures probably did, they smoked one of the legs above the campfire while they were doing the other, so that smoking it and sugaring and salting it like bacon, that's how bacon was invented. It stopped the flies from landing on it because once you smoked it, there was no exposed surface area with weeping, oozing juices to make parasites come and land on it. So it was a way to keep what they had to sustain their existence. Because again, like I said, cooking is all about staying alive. But what do, and in your chili, we're not using those pieces of meat. No, uh, we're using <laughs> beef raised down in Waxahachie from Rosewood uh, Ranches, which is owned by the Hunt family. Yeah, uh, friend of mine's their corporate chef. Um, it's pasture raised beef. It's really high quality. It's local. Um, you got to start with good ingredients and people think chili oh that's easy i can just go buy ground beef store you can and it's perfectly edible and it's fine but 
I figure if I'm going to charge somebody what I am for a bowl of food that's in a plastic take-home container, it better be way better than you could make at home. So and what do you, you know, what are you doing on yours? I'm, I can't make a great chili, okay? And I'm just super curious about how you make yours. Well, I just take as few spices as possible so you don't hide the fact that it tastes like beef. Mm-hmm. You add enough that it's on a scale of one to five, you try and hit the middle because you don't want to melt somebody's face, but you also don't want it to be so mild that people say this is not chili. And living in Texas, as you said, people can be critical. So you want to you want to try and achieve that balance that makes everyone happy. The best way to do that, and like a lot of businesses, especially marketing anything, is take a focus group. Make it for a bunch of friends and let them all try and take their feedback. If five say it's too hot and 20 say it's just right, then probably go with the 20. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, pretty Long simple business. <laughs> pretty simple business. All right. Well, well, chef, this was really, really good. I love, listen, I, I just, I've never had a conversation thinking about the art and the science. I, one thing I would take away from this is I think all chefs are like, to, but I've, I've never heard a chef talk the amount of art that you have plus all the science. And, and how important that is to bring those two together, which is very similar to what you know we do here on the show, right? We talk about the art of marketing and the science of marketing and bringing it together. But your perspective was really, really cool. So tell me a little bit more. Hey, before we go, tell me a little bit more about your business. I mean, you're you're an entrepreneur now, man. You're you're out there doing your vision, but it's for your business. So how are things going? And and kind of what have you learned about that experience or from that um, experience? I'm fortunate. I uh, you know, and talking about what we led into. Um, Thanks to Steve's failure, you know, we didn't see the real graphic, but two <laughs> failures and a success. I am in, thanks to COVID, forced to get out of my comfort zone and keep trying. Like a lot of people say, the only reason you fail is when you stop trying. So I took a former Pizza Hut that was the busiest Pizza Hut in North Texas, numbers wise, from Yum Brands, um, and took it. It had been closed two years, opened up a to go catering during COVID. Frisco Lakes is nearby, a lunch and retirement uh, area, plus my neighborhood where Will and I live few miles away. People don't like to leave the peninsula we joke about, but I figure people want my food. Uh, I was cooking out of my house. I had a health permit during COVID, but I'm like, let me take this business that's working. People seem to be busy. They're working at home. They're working remote. They don't want to go in their kitchen because they're there all the time. This at least gets them out for a few minutes. People pop up, say hi, see me, grab some good food, grab food for three days, take it home and heat it up. You're buying. I I mean, I'll make healthy. I'll make light. I'll make uh, decadent like a link cuisine, but no chemicals, no additives. It's not from a grocery store. You know who made it, you know what's in it. You're supporting a small business. Everyone likes to support small business. And usually people like to support their friends and people who try. So all of that worked to my favor and with the timing. My success was so great that the space next door to me, the subway closed because they failed to keep up with their, their cleanliness and their clients. And during COVID, they went to Uber Eats and people aren't going out to get a $5 foot long. And then they had bad marketing, which goes back to that. And then they had a spokesperson they chose that epically, who who knew that was going to go so sideways as it did for them. I feel bad. But Subway just had a lot of things that kind of led to their brand identity being tarnished and diminished. And I think they made some missteps. And if a huge corporation like that can fail, I felt like I could too, but I'm going to jump in and take advantage of their failure and try and make it this a success. The location was there. I had the kitchen. I had the footprint. I didn't have the cash. Um, I'm a new business. No one believed in me. I couldn't get a loan. So I had to find a way through grassroots kind of fundraising and also through my own strategy of let's take the profits. Let's take an even bigger risk. My wife was on board and I poured everything I had made from the first venture into the new one but I made it bigger. I got a liquor license. Very trepidatious experience. I don't wish that on anyone. And I caution anyone. If you don't have any experience, seek help. I'll help you if I can, but find a professional. That's a daunting task. Um, But going out and taking my experience of wine, my experience of food, having worked in hotels and clubs and high-end venues, now I can bring that level of hospitality to kind of a casual setting that I can bring in the community where I live, something that helps. And if I'm successful, I can help the education foundation. I can help not only my kids, but other people's kids. I can give 
people who've never worked in a restaurant a chance to come work here. So a lot of my friends' kids work for me. College kids come back and work for me. I'm able to teach a new generation how to cook because guess what? Someone taught me. I'm not self-taught. I'm taught by other people who took a chance on a kid from Texas City who had never picked up a knife, who didn't even know he needed to have his own knives when he went to the first real hotel at the San Luis and Galveston. And the chef's like, where's your knife roll? I said, what's that? <laughs> he said, it's a kit you carry your knives in. I said, I don't have any knives except hunting knives. He goes, those won't work here. I said, so then what are you talking about? He said, you need to go buy a set of knives. I said, I need a job to have money to put gas in my car. What are you talking about knives? He says, they're only a couple hundred bucks. I said, and that's what my rent is. What are you talking about buy knives? Don't you have one I can use? He said, I'll charge you a dollar a day. I said, I could have my own in 90 days if I did that. He says, exactly. So he gave me a hundred out of his pocket. He said, you put in a hundred, I'll put in a hundred. Pay me back when you get the money. That's how I went about my first knife. If it weren't for Jack Barnes, and I still got that knife to this day. So, what kind of knife is it? It's a Hinkle's German steel chef knife, eight inch. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. What's your favorite knife? Um, probably that one. Yeah. Yep. It's wooden handle, not plastic. Perfect balance. Just sits right in the hand, just right. It's like an extension of my arm. Do you have one of those sexy Serbian knives, those big ones? That... No, nah, you know, I don't have the Damascus and the, the foodies and the globals. And I, I'm an old school guy. I mean, look at my gray hair. I like German <laughs> knives, German steel. You got to know how to sharpen them. And German cheese. Last clearly forever. I mean, I've been doing this 40 something years now. Still yeah. got the original knife. Still cool. Sharp. Cool. Well, it's time. It's time. It's time to, to wrap it up. Well, hey, Chef Wade Birch, thank you so much. This has been a great hour of the Mind State Marketing Hour. I hear, I hear some ducks in the background. Here, here they come. Just, here they come. Coming. Feeding the ducks. Feeding the ducks. With Chef Wade sound. Birch. It's the Mind State Marketing Hour. We've had Wade Birch, Chef Wade Birch, on our show today. His uh, restaurant is WD's Kitchen and catering in the Little Elm area. Wrong? Is that right? That's right. Another great episode on the Mind State Marketing Hour with Will Leach. Will, if someone wants to reach out to you, give us a real quick. Yep. If you want to learn more about how to grow your brand or business, go to mindstategroup.com. We have these big red boxes on our website that says schedule time. You can spend half hour with me. We can look at your marketing together and I will give you some neurological and psychological insights um, in your marketing, what you're doing well, what you're not doing so well, and hopefully give you some uh, advice to help you get the most out of your marketing. So mindstategroup.com, you can learn more about that or check out my book, Marketing into Mind States. I'm hungry. I know. <laughs> Do you know we're a podcast team? Be sure to subscribe and listen on all those channels and more, your favorite one for sure. Subscribe on YouTube, Mind State channel. Share with your friends, your family, and we'll see you next time on the Mind State Marketing Hour team. Thanks again, Chef. Appreciate you. We My appreciate pleasure. it very much. Love you some ducks. <laughs> <laughs>